Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 18th meeting of the Welfare Reform Committee for 2015. Uh, could I ask uh, all those present to make sure that the mobile phones and other electronic devices are switched to silent and uh, airplane mode? Um, thank you. Um, item one on the agenda, can we um, agree to take... Um, oh, sorry, the, the first item uh, on the agenda is... Um, to take item three in private, is that agreed? Okay. Um, item two in the agenda, um, we, we have a slight change to what had originally been planned. Um, and can I uh, welcome to the meeting uh, Phil, who is a, a support worker uh, for Diane. Diane, unfortunately, uh, is unable to attend, um, I think, for family reasons, but Phil. Um, her support worker from Inclusion Scotland has agreed um, to read out her statement. Can also welcome uh, Jake and Donna. Uh, we do appreciate you taking the time to, to come to the meeting today. We realise that it can be quite a stressful uh, experience for people who are not familiar um, with the, the parliamentary proceedings. But you know, I can assure you that we will do everything that we can to make you feel comfortable today and if at any time you're not sure of anything that something that's said isn't clear just stop me or stop anyone else uh, in, in the committee um, so that you're able to play as full a part in, in the proceedings as, as you can but uh, we, we do appreciate you um, coming along. So can we start um, by asking Phil if he will read out um, the, the statement um, from Diane, and it's my understanding that you're just reading the statement and there's there's no questions or, or other comments, is that correct? Um, I'm happy to take questions and, and answer them as best I can. I have been working with Dan quite closely throughout, uh, throughout this, right. so okay. th there may be questions I can answer. Right. Okay, uh, thank, I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to make sure that Dan's uh, statement is heard. Um, I have an email here from her which I will read first and then I'll go on to the statement. Um, she says, I'm really sorry, but having discussed things with my GP this morning, I have to take medical advice and say that the committee will just be too much for me tomorrow, so I won't be attending. The problem with my statement is it doesn't say that I claim employ employment support allowance and I'm in the work-related activity group. Though at the time of the work capability assessment, a job centre plus advisor s suggested I ought to appeal that as I was so ill. Unfortunately, I didn't feel able to do that, as although I had been referred to the committee mental health, community mental health team by my GP, I had not at that time seen a psychiatrist and so did not feel able to appeal the outcome. I would, of course, be happy to answer any questions um, on any point in my statement by email or meeting uh, later in private when I'm less agitated and upset. I'll move on to the statement. I've been on the work programme for some time. I applied for a paid internship opportunity because I was hopeful it would be the next step in my journey towards recovering enough to go into more substantial long-term employment. I was giving up a volunteering placement which had been running quite successfully to do this. I have a generalised anxiety disorder and once I get anxious about things, whatever the trigger and no matter how minor they might seem to other folks, this becomes increasingly difficult to manage and I engage in self-harming behaviours and have persistent, overwhelming, suicidal thoughts which are very difficult to cope with. I also get very upset and very agitated very easily, which is difficult for others to cope with, as you will have seen. It takes ages for me to regain some sort of like equilibrium. To have made the move from doing voluntary work to sustaining this paid internship, I really needed things to go smoothly. I also have a vestibular condition, which means I can be badly affected by certain types of movement and activity on computer screens. I wanted to get access to work help for equipment to help me with my vestibular condition, which means I really need an especially wide screen so that I have enough space to have everything on screen rather than swapping between windows all the time. Unfortunately, my work program advisor did not seem to really know anything about applying for access to work. With the support of the internship project staff, that would be me, I got an application started and was hoping for a quick assessment that would get the equipment I need. In order to make it easier for me, I attempted to authorise access to work to communicate with a support staff member from Inclusion Scotland on my behalf. However, it turned out that my claim could not be processed until the DWP reset a flag on my benefit claim 
something to do with this being permitted work. My work program advisor didn't know about this and it took time for access to work to alert me to the situation. Because the application was not preceded, they did not process the third party permission form, so I had to deal with them directly. There had to be a process of the permitted work being approved by a different decision maker in the DWP separately to both my work program advisor and my job centre plus advisor. Communication between them all did not go smoothly and it was very stressful at one point even leading to one member of DWP staff saying that they would be submitting a complaint about another's handling of the matter. By the time it was sorted out, over six weeks had passed since I began the placement. Not only did this mean a long period of me trying to manage without the right equipment and support that I needed, it meant we missed the normal six-week time frame for applying to access to work. This could have meant that Project Scotland might have ended up footing some of the bill for any equipment that the assessors recommended, or at least there would have to be negotiations with access to work about it. I have been very anxious about causing Pro Project Scotland additional costs in this way. So this issue has been a major barrier for me returning to work. Both the actual difficulty in getting the right equipment and the anxiety I have felt about causing such an expense and difficulty to Project Scotland. It is not at all Project Scotland's fault that this has happened. I did also want access to work to fund the support person for me who is an employability specialist to help me sustain the internship. This has been funded from a different source via my work programme provider, for which I am tremendously grateful. There were also two times that my benefit has been suspended incorrectly, both related to this change in my circumstances. In both cases, they were sorted out quite quickly, but both caused a lot of stress and distress at the time. In neither case was there any warning that this would happen, and in each case the shortfall was more than £500, which is a considerable sum when my total income a month is about £1,100, including the Project Scotland salary, and my rent is £650. So you see, there have been a lot of issues which have impacted on how sustainable this internship has been for me, and I have been really un uh, very unwell as a result. It has been a complete nightmare, and my GP has been very concerned about me. In fact, the only positive thing to come out of all this is that I've been fast-tracked onto an NHS treatment programme which was first recommended by my consultant in November 2013. How is it that being on the work programme, which is meant to help me get into work, means that when I get offered work and want to do it as permitted work as part of a gradual process towards coming off benefits and gaining sustainable employment, that means, means that I can't even apply for the very support I needed to be put in place right away until a complicated process of getting permission takes place? How is it that no one seemed to be able to be very clear with me about what was needed promptly and ensure the right things were done? I thought it would be useful to quickly summarise what, what happened before finishing the statement. So Dan has a serious mental health condition uh, as well as some physical and sensory impairment. She was told she was fit for work and she tried to get into work. She was put on the work programme, who although well-meaning and friendly and supportive, clearly lacked the training to support yeah. her needs. She volunteered, working hard to get ready for work, took the internship to try and get into work, um, into paid work. Her housing benefit was stopped twice. She was denied access to work for months because she still hasn't got it. Uh, and it's, it's now been a lot longer than six weeks uh, due to the bureaucracy at the DWP. The workplace, uh, the work programme advisor seemingly knew nothing about access to work in the first place. And all of this has resulted in mental health damage that has caused significant harm and risk of suicide. Her statement concludes, how is it that my earnest efforts to get into work should result in my being financially punished twice, albeit temporarily, th through incorrect automatic cancellation of benefits payments? The very system that is meant to be helping me get into work has actually set me back greatly in my process of doing so. It is hard not to feel that the system is deliberately designed this way in the hopes of encouraging people like me to just go away and give up. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Phil. We'll leave any questions or comments um, until we, we, we hear all the, the statements. Um, Jake and, and Don are supported today um, by um, someone from the, the Poverty Truth Commission. Um, we're interested in hearing what you um, have found uh, to be your experience on the work programme. What are the issues that you've, you've been facing? Um, what improvements do you think can be made? Um, you know, we've already heard quite a harrowing uh, account of, of an experience um, 
of, you know, of, of Diane's experience in the work programme. Um, what about from your perspective, what has it been like? I think, Jake, you want to go first? Yeah. Thanks very much for inviting myself. Uh, my name's Jacqueline, by the way, but I'm known as Jake. Uh, I, I live in Glasgow. I was on a work programme a few years ago, just under two years ago, uh, with the Indus. And I'm, a, I'm part of a self-reliant group in Glasgow, which originally set, set up a cafe and is now trying to run a laundry business. I've done all this voluntary thing, but only seems to have caused problems with the work programme when I was on it. I had six advis advisors during my time on the work programme. That's one of the problems. You keep getting moved from one advisor to another. Sometimes they make you sit on the phone from nine to five each day, making calls for jobs. But you know you're not going to get anything. It's depressing. I didn't like the fact it's all open plan too, and you get no privacy. Uh, the only help I got myself when is I referred myself to the jobs and business. Uh, no, sorry, so I went to the business gateway for help first to try and start up my business in Andre. Uh, business gateway couldn't take me on because I was on a work program. I had to wait till I was finished that. So the only thing that's really helped me was I referred myself to Jobs and Business Glasgow, where I got some support for things I want to do through the Employability Fund. Some, some of the training days have been good too, such as the first aid course and I did the, done the food and hygiene course. But the main problem was myself through the volunteering. I was volunteering for four years and I'm still volunteering. And we run the wee business in the church, but I still don't get income off that just now. Then I can only do as much as look on it as a problem. But for me, it may be my way out of this. And at the time, a lot of my friends had been sanctioned, but I didn't get sanctioned myself through being on the work programme. In the end, I felt bullied as if I had to go and get a job just to get them off my back. So I worked from half nine, eh, half five in the morning till nine o'clock in the morning. Plus I do my voluntary every day of the week, running the wee laundrette business for my church. So that's a wee bit about the work programme I've done myself. As I say, that was previous until just now. OK, thank you very much for that. Donna? OK, my name's Donna. I come from Glasgow. Um, when I was first made redundant, um, I was redundant for six months, but um, I had got really sick, worrying about being sanctioned and things like that. Um, I ended up, the reasons why I was made redundant as well made me stressed. So I ended up stressed. So six months, um, I was on a panel for only sick, and I was called into a work programme. So I first went, I got a letter for the work programme saying, if you need any help, you need any support or anything like that. And it seemed really encouraging. So first of all, I turned up and I had, my first um, person that they'd given me to help me was a guy who, to him, maybe he was encouraging me, but I felt very bullied, no? He was kind of like, look at you compared to them all there. Look, and he actually made me feel um, like I was imagining my problems, that like I really didn't have any problems. And I'd worked all my life, and I just thought, this guy, I thought I was coming here to get encouraged to work, because I had great, I had some ideas, I'd got lots of life skills, I had other areas where I could work. And I was actually quite excited to meet this person, but I just felt like he was trying to get me, you could do that job, do you? You could do that job, you know, you're not if you've not got a leg missing and things like that, he was saying to me. So twice each time he'd made me great, do you know, I, I just felt really, and I had lowest confidence with being made redundant, so he kind of put me right down there. So then I got um, a second advisor, and he was great, but I had him for about two weeks, and then he moved on. But then they finally gave me a, a, a different person who was being brilliant, she um, was very supportive. She sat down and she gave me some time, you know, she kind of, a, she um, gave me, she asked me about myself, she, um, and she treated me like an individual. She didn't, like the first advisor, he sent me on um, a confidence building, because I said I'd lost a lot of my confidence, and uh, he sent me on this, um, there was about 25 people, I would say, in this room, all the ages from 18 to about 63, 64, with totally different backgrounds. There was nothing confident building about it. It was just a tick box that we had done this, you know, you just, and the people in the program says, oh, it was only like that because we always get more people in than we need. So that, because a lot of people don't t turn up at these programs. So that was the reason for them having this. But for that being the first program I had worked for years and years, this was me getting confidence building and I just felt, 
I have nothing in common with an 18 year old, do you know what I mean? Or, and I just felt like it was a waste of time and energy and a waste of, um, so that was the next, and then, but now I have a working links advisor who's helped me get self-employed. She's listening to me with what, what skills I've got. Now I'm like, right, I can actually, like Jack, I'll probably need to work just now while I, I try and get myself self-employed in the back burner. But I'll still have this person to advise me. So now I've got this individual person that teach, treats me like an individual. No, um, I don't feel demoralised. I think the atmosphere in these places, you can, it smells a red bull. And it's they, they, there's a horrible, fearful atmosphere. And it's the staff that are sitting with Red Bull, do you know what I mean, a lot of the time, and the people who are coming in. Nobody's happy, it's not a happy space. Because you're getting people that, you're getting to help the doctor, you, can, you don't need to work, we'll put you on a panel, then they're getting a letter saying, you need to work, or you're going to get sanctioned, you're going to get this. So, I just feel like, we need to look at people as, as, as individuals, no? and I think it's demoralising. If you dig, you need to get your bus first and things like that, there's no... Um, discreetness where you could just sit at the desk and get it done. No, no, you have to walk in front of everybody. You know, it's like a, um, in front of the whole place and they all see you getting your two pounds or your four pounds and you need to sign in the photocopy. And I know they need to follow the money, but there must be an easier way than doing that. Than, do you know what I mean? I, I just feel embarrassed having to do that. Um, so that's my experience. And, and, and if you get the right advisor, it's a great experience. But if, you, if you're not going to get people with, that have got empathy, that just want a job done, then there's no way you're going to get help. Do you understand? One of the things that I think has come up in, in each of the three contributions is there's a bureaucracy there. And, you know, I think, uh, Jake, you talked, how many, is it six? Six advisors? You know, which is just incredible. You know, where's the the continuity, where's the personal relationship? Uh, are, are the people that, that are helping you, are, do you, do you think, are they on targets? <laughs> and, and the targets help if they're trying to develop a personal relationship? I know the work programme that I was on, that was the induce. A few of the advisors says to myself, uh, that obviously they're working to targets and they're getting things we'd you need to put so many people into work. I put so many people through this because there was an incentive. Uh, the employers, if you were taking somebody on for six months, there was a thousand pound. Then, if the person was still in employment after six months time, there was another thousand pound bonus. But that was going to let the the work program, let the the higher up, let the big business scheme. So I heard that a few times. So that's what I'm saying. They're all obviously working to targets. You see, not all of them are quite bad and that. Some of you had good ones, you had bad ones, but some of the, the, most of the way they treated you was like a piece of dirt. You were trying to explain your situation, but they're not listening. You just do as you have to do. The government is giving you the money, you do as you're told, so that's what you were doing. If you didn't do that, you were sanctioned because you didn't fill your diary in. It's yeah. also interesting, mm -hmm. both Jake and Donna, you, you, you mentioned, both of you mentioned, try to look at self-employment. Now, self-employment can be hugely stressful um, because you're, you're, on, you're out there, you're on your own, you're living in a sense from day to day, week, week to week, um, you don't have the same employment rights and conditions to fall back on as, you know, as others might have. Was self-employment something that, that you thought was a desirable um, destination or was it something that because there's no other jobs there, well, let, let's try self-employment. What, what, why did the discussion about self-employment come up? Uh, through myself being part of the self-reliant group which started in Glasgow, uh -huh. uh, a group of eight women from the area, we all got together, what can we do for our community? So we started a wee lunch club for our pensioners. Mm -hmm. And I've always worked for years and years as well, but through the process of bringing my three sons up, me and my partner didn't, well, there was a personal problem, so I had to stop work and concentrating on bringing my three sons up now. So two's 20 now, and one's 18, one's in the armed forces, one's working and one's at college. So now that I can find a lot more time, I was always worked in a, a laundry business, working in a student's accommodation, doing all the washing and that. So I said, I had a wee idea. I, could, I would like to 
run my own. And through being part of the group with eight girls in my area, telling them my wee story, so we got all that together. We put a wee pound in a pot and through that we... But that's a big, big, long story, and I'm, it's a bit long for these to kind of hear that. That's kind of my personal, how from where I was at the work programme, going to the job centre, through work, work we club, we, we've opened our wee laundry business, but I can't take a penny off that just now because I'm earning myself. So we have a business advisor that's working with me just now through our revolution office that's helping us go through the process piece by piece quite easy. It's not, not quite harrowing. That and, and, and both of mm. you mentioned the, the big rooms that you were in, um, you know, having to make the calls. And I think, Jake, you, you talked about um, sometimes being on the phone from 95 each day looking for jobs. You know, both of you are from Glasgow. Um, Glasgow's changed hugely over the years. Like, you know, uh, when my family were from the East End of Glasgow, and in those days you had heavy engineering, you had steelworks, you know, you had the forge, um, you had places where it was traditionally men would go to work. But even for, for women, you know, there were, like my mother worked in McFarlane Langs and, and, and so on. But there's nothing now in the East End of Glasgow, and, you know, big parts of Glasgow are the same. So when you're in these places phoning, uh, you know, are there realistic jobs available or are they just putting you through that because that's what the process demands? Putting you through emotions. The tick box, isn't it? Yep. So what, what kind of jobs are they asking you to phone about? Well, uh, you put down your sp specified jobs, cleaning, catering, uh, housekeeping, laundries, mass four specifics, right, okay. it's marked down. So you'll get in and let you, they'll give you a booklet. They've checked up on the computer, your advisor. So they'll give you a big booklet. So they've got all these businesses on it. So you have to sit and go through each business and f or the phone numbers. You sit there and you phone them up. Hi, my name's Jacqueline. I'm looking to see if you have any vacancies at the moment. You go through the rigmarole, then you tick no, 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 no. So you so don't even know that there's a job there. You're no, just phoning on spec to just, think yeah. you know, that there, there might be one. Mm -hmm. And the reason for going self-employment is tax credits. We're good on it initially when they come out family tax credits. And that's uh -huh. all, being a single mum... That worked well for me, do you know what I mean? So, in self employment, it was zero contracts and all that. I mean, where's the security? Do you know what I mean? So, at least if you're trying to date yourself. You know, was, you that, was your experience the same as Jake's that no. you were having to phone and you didn't know whether there was any vacancies? Um, no, because I think Jake um, has been aware of advisor and been in the programme for longer than me, do you know what I mean? Right. So, but I'm just getting encouragement to set up my own business just now. And, and as well as kind of looking to see what work, part time work I can do. What, what kind of business would that be? And um, doing therapies. So I, I, I run out like a music workshop for kids, but I do that voluntary. But also doing massage, Reiki, Aki detox, things like that. Right. So what I was trying to do, and I think that's what's missing in your communities. We need to relax a wee bit. <laughs> you know what I mean? And in, 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 in your society, not just in uh, your communities. So I think, I so I think that's. That's one avenue that seems to be growing, do you know what I mean? They need the therapy, so that is why I chose that, because we are so much more stressed than right. our society, but it's trying to get in and get started. Right. Open it up, any, any other? Could I? Yeah. Sorry, yeah, Phil. Could I say something about the, uh, the, the experience that, that Diane had seems to have been quite different in terms of the amount of pressure she was put under to apply for jobs. She's not talked about any of that sort of experience of being made to go through a list and just phone up speculatively. Um, and to me, what it, what it seems like is uh, they didn't expect her to get into work um, and they didn't spend a lot of time on her because they were l unlikely to get their, uh, their payment for her. Um, and when she turned, she, it wasn't through their efforts that she found our internship programme. She went and looked for it herself. She went out, she put the effort in and she applied to us and she got offered the, the position. Uh, and I don't know, but it's possible, even though it's not gone very well because of the issues I've, I've told you about, that they're still going to get the outcome payment for that, despite having contributed nothing to the to what little success there has been. And in fact, having held it back because they didn't know to tell her, you need to get your permitted work signed off before you apply to access to work. Right, OK. Kevin? Um, thank you. Um, I'm always interested to hear what folks have done previously. And Jake, you said that you 
were involved in, in doing student laundry before bringing up your kids. Um, what job did you have before, Donna? I was a development worker for the Church of Scotland. So, a, a, a pretty... But I actually work in a, and I live in a poor area. Uh -huh. So, I kind of... A, I worked there four years voluntary, then I last six years I was paid work. Okay. So, in terms of the work that you've done, in terms of bringing up your kids and all the rest, nobody could could say that you've you've skived as the the UK government seems to, no, always to think. Worked. Always worked. Always worked. So when you go into these places and you've got often it seems folks who are pretty demeaning about the situation that you find yourself in, what does that do to your confidence? You're instantly stigmatised, you know. You can go you get a built up thing anyway because you come for the East End of Glasgow, do you know what I mean? You get a built up shield. But um but it just feels like you're labelled and you're all seen as you're no trying, you're all the negativity stuff that the media try and portray as East End. You take that label on board, do you know what I mean? But um I don't think we should. I think we should shrug it off because a lot of communities bring a lot of love and hope and togetherness, do you know what I mean? So I'm kind of a sidetrack here, sorry. It's all right. I'm <laughs> quite happy to hear about love and hope and togetherness. Yes, there's some great things are coming through East End, do you know what I mean? Are are in a poverty area. But um, and trying to find a job, you should be encouraged. Not, do you know, I, I know, see if I stuck with the first advisor who was totally negative, I wouldn't be work, I wouldn't be even trying for a job. I'd still be depressed. But because I'm with somebody who actually believed in me and, and actually was kind to me, was made all the difference. Humanity. I she come, gave me hope. I come from a deprived area as well. I've lived there for a very, very long time. Um, and, you know, sometimes I get similar reactions when I tell folk where I come from. Do you think that that's part of the problem, that some of these advisors look at your postcode, your address, and think... Especially with types of jobs that you want to go for. I come from a poor area. The jobs I want are usually given to the middle class. So I find that very difficult, just in general, the, the barriers. Never mind if you're, you know, like... And I'm coming from being unemployed now, so it's very hard to get back into work. So as well so as... So it's then. kind of a... It's a jobs for the boys a lot of the time, I find. You know how, like... Um, so I start trying to set up a new business when the charity money and things like that are all going straight to the middle, as usual, the, all the big charities get all the money. So I find it's hard to try and set up something new. And I know that's not quite what we're talking about, but it's the same kind of area. But it's all right for them, but it's not right for us. So as well as them ticking the boxes, as, as you described, to, to meet <coughs> their, their targets, they're actually putting you in a box as well, are they? Yeah, as we can why you're the describing door. it. Would that be fair to say? Yeah. Can, can I ask, um, Phil, in terms of Diane's situation, where obviously there are, are some complex problems there, and it says in her statement um, that, you know, some of the staff there have done their level best, um, and it seems that um, where that has not happened some of the folks that have been involved in that case have actually wanted to complain about others who have been handling her case. Is that, is that true? I, I don't know too much of the detail, but yes, my understanding is that the, the, the person who was meant to process uh, Diane's sort of approval to do permitted work, uh, I'm not entirely clear on why, if you're on a work program, you need permission to do permitted work, but apparently that was the case. And the person who was supposed to process that didn't ha didn't do it correctly uh, in some way, and was then quite uh, poor in their attitude towards Diane and her advisor uh, in in dealing with that. Um, and my understanding is that the advisor was then talking about c going to going above their head and, and raising a complaint. I'm afraid that's all the, the detail I have on that. Was that a dispute between the? whatever organisation was dealing with a work programme and the DWP or...? Uh, no, I believe that was a dispute between her job advisor at the DWP and whoever it is, whoever's job it was, because apparently it was someone at some other department that makes the decision about whether or not she can do permitted work. So, uh, a bit of a, a rigmarole there.
finally, I, I mean, one of the things is that we've been told that these programmes are trying to boost folks' confidence and get them back into work. Do you think that the work programme boosted your confidence or did it actually make you more depressed? Um, you talked about Red Bull and depression, Donna, yeah. in the office. Do you think it helped build confidence in any way, shape or form? I think giving the right, the right advisor, it doesn't matter where you are, somebody's believing in you, you can work through whatever, whatever environment. I think it's, you, and it's very hard to find the right advisors, I understand that. But, I, I, you know, like people go to the brew, and, and uh, the brew, I use all fine, old fashioned language, but people go sign on or whatever in the brew, and, and see if they were made to feel like, how are you the day, instead of making you feel like, you're beneath me. Yeah. yeah. Have you made that person? I'm sure that people would uh, enable you to work. You believe in yourself and you can go and do a job. But people keep putting you down. You you therefore then believe it. So I think I think it's a hard thing to, to get around that. Do you feel the same way, Jake? Yeah, I did at the time. Was I said things was uh, two years ago. Uh, I had the problems with injuries because I'd done my full uh, two years working with them. I was getting passed from pillar to post. I was asking the job centre for advice, uh, injuries for advice, and they were saying, you deal with injuries, you're on your paperwork now, and you were asking injuries, see the job centre, and every time I was going in, they couldn't put me into a box, to a, I came out of the box and dealt with things myself. Is the same go for, for Diane as well, do you think? For Absolutely. She was... A very, she's very conf has been very confused about whose job it is to do what in regard to between her work program advisor, her job advisor, whoever this other person that has to sign off the permitted work. It's, it's all been a bit unclear to her who she was supposed to go to. Um, from, from my part, I, I, I was just doing the best to support her as a disabled person trying to get into work, and that's specifically what our program is for. Um, getting access to work quickly was absolutely vital, and it, it just it couldn't happen. Can I thank you and can I wish you all the best with your, your businesses? I, I hope that they're a great success. Thank you. Just before I, I bring Claire in, can, can I come back to, to these phone calls uh, looking for jobs? Um, two things. Are you given a list of vacancies to, to follow up? And the second thing is, What's the, the, the response like when you're phoning companies cold to ask if they've got any um, any vacancies? Is it quite a cut response? No. And that's it. You know, how does it make you feel when you get that kind of brush off? Well, the, the booklet I got was all the businesses, all the names of all the cleaning companies, the laundry companies. You were just to phone up and say you're looking for work. Most of them say, no, don't phone here again. <coughs> so you were just to mark down beside your... But when you're phoned so they're, and what? They're getting annoyed because, so they're getting annoyed if because you're doing it, yeah. then God knows uh -huh. how many other people are doing it. Uh -huh. And I, I know some friends that work in one of the big council buildings that were saying a lot more mail was coming in. They knew it was coming for lots of different work programmes. Mm -hmm. And they just don't deal with it at all. They just go just shred all that. Chair, could you, could you could get a copy of that. Can we get a copy of what people are given? So, for example, if you are given a booklet with a list of numbers and some instructions of what to do, that, could we get a could well, we get we a rise ask, in that? Um, we, we, we've got, um, what, what, which company was it you were with? Inges. Inges. I, I don't know if they're... Right, they're in next week, so we could... We'll see if we can get it ahead of next week. But we could ask Simon if, if we could get that ahead. As as this, right, this, is, this is, in effect, state-sanctioned cold calling. <laughs> That's what it is. If, if, if it's as you've described, I've no reason to doubt you, but I would like to get my eyes on it myself. You go in the computer desks are all out over there, and everybody's sitting at their desk with their booklets phoning up, and you're just marked down. Then you go back maybe the following week and refresh. Did you phone them back again? Yes, yes, <laughs> still the same answer. Dear God. And companies are also saying, um, if they see that it's coming for maybe whatever organisation, the workplace, they're not entertaining it, not even looking at it. Do you know what I mean? So if you're getting, and I, spent, I, I tried to get a job whilst I was in um, that agency, and I was applying, and they couldn't get it to forward it. 
do you know how like to get through at the next stage this application and the advisor came and I had about six people who were trying to access the application for the job that advertised so they send the advertisement but it's really difficult and I sent them an email asking for it and eventually I got one after about five days and I'm sure if I'd done that from my home I wouldn't uh, but I'm sure it's because I'd done it from Martin Links. Thank you. Claire? Yeah, I, um, thank, you, thank you very much for your um, contribution today. It's, we really appreciate you all coming in. Um, what, what I'd really like to, to ask is, at any time where you're given an opportunity to feed back, um, particularly I'm thinking of the confidence building course, um, you know, was there a, a, an assessment sheet at the end? Did you find it useful? Was there any kind of quality control at all that you were able to give at any point on the work programme? I got an apology from them saying too many people had turned up, never, um, and normally they would do that, but because so many people had turned up, that they, they, they didn't have a chance to run the actual programme on the day. So did you get an opportunity to do it another time? Well, I did say, well, can you take in my complaint that that was demoralising and I felt embarrassed and I felt worse confidence mm -hmm. after it. And so there wasn't, it wasn't written down, but I did tell my advisor that. So you wasn't got, got an apology, but not an opportunity to get to, the training to, yeah. that they said that you needed. Or a second confidence building class. Mm -hmm. right. And and just to, um, if I could ask ask Phil, um, you mentioned that there's a feeling that the most difficult people to reach, if you like, the, the people that need the most support are the ones that are getting the least help in this situation. Um, if you come across, um, I know you're here to represent Diane's statement today, but is, is it quite common that the equipment that's needed to help disabled people, is, 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 there's delays in getting that in place? Uh, unfortunately, it's extremely common. Uh, access to work is hugely under-promoted. Uh, uh, as a general rule, uh, vast, vast uh, numbers of employers have never heard of it in their lives. Um, frequently, when I go in to support uh, these paid internships and I talk to the employers and say, have you ever heard of access to work? No. Uh, and the same is true for the interns themselves. Um, but once you get down the process, if it's fairly simple, it can be reasonably quick, but reasonably quick is still two or three weeks. And that means you could be in the job for a couple of weeks without the equipment you need. Um, you know, you can imagine for someone, say, who's deaf, not having sign language interpreters, that's a, bit, a huge barrier. But if you've got the, the sort of severe mental health um, and anxiety-related issues that Diane has, it, it has a catastrophic effect. Diane is much worse off than she was when she started this, this process. She was in a much better place and much, much better mental health than she is now. Um, and that's not, that's not what's supposed to happen. And, and in terms of the, the access to work, do, do you think the DWP understand their responsibilities and the, and the people involved in the work programme understand that what's there and what's available and, and do they, are they able to deal with it properly? Um, it, it seems from my experience um, that a lot of people who are providing uh, the work programme don't have nearly enough knowledge of access to work, don't have nearly enough knowledge of what is needed to support a disabled person, the concept of reasonable adjustments and alterations to a work environment that can make a huge difference. Um, it's not what they're, tra they're necessarily trained to do. Um, and, um, and access to work is part of that, but it's not just about access to work, it's about understanding where people are coming from. And, 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 and I think you, you talked about the individual approach. The individual approach is absolutely key um, to disabled people, because no two, two people's requirements are the same. Um, the, there's definitely more needing done to, to make people aware of access to work, but I think when you're trying to support uh, disabled people getting into work, the people involved need to know what they're talking about um, and they can have the best will. Dan's very complimentary about her work programme advisor, lovely person, very friendly, tried his best, just clearly didn't have the training he needed uh, and that's not his fault, that's the, the systems. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just before I bring John in on that point, I know Christina's want to come in. Can, can, can I just stick with this issue about um, people with disabilities, um, whether it's you know, mental health issues or, or other things, try to get into work. You, you know, places like Glasgow, it's a pretty competitive market. It's a lot of people uh, looking for jobs, and there's not a lot of jobs there. Um, how successful 
other programmes and getting disabled people into work because, you know, many employers would probably take the easy route out. If, if you're looking to hire somebody and you've got someone with either a disability or someone who's come through a significant period uh, of mental health problems, and then you've got somebody where there are no issues, the easy way out for an employer is to take the person where they don't have to make any effort. To, to. So how successful are these programmes in helping people with disabilities to get into work? Uh, or, or are, again, is it just tokenism? Um, I'm afraid I don't have the statistics immediately at hand, but um, my understanding is that they are woefully un unsuccessful. Um, that the, the success rates of getting uh, disabled people into work through the, the programme are, are very low. Uh, work choices uh, has better results because work choices is um, a bit more voluntary and it is specifically uh, aimed at people with additional support needs. So it, it tends to have better results. Um, but um, I think um, if I can give an example, uh, we worked on a, the, the internship program that Dan's taking part in um, is in its second year. And the reason it's in its second year is that in the first year, we had a great deal of trouble getting disabled people to apply for the opportunities. And the reason for that primarily was that they had to apply through the DWP, through their job advisor. So you have people who are terrified of being sanctioned, um, being told if you want to apply for an opportunity that's specifically uh, avail you know, aimed at you, uh, you have to go and tell your job advisor that you're, you, you, you're, you feel ready for work. And it was a huge disincentive. I, I think it's it's a cultural thing. Um, the, the, they they don't feel that the system is is actually designed to help them. They feel it's designed to punish them. John and then Christina. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to go back to your point about access to work fund because I had a meeting uh, quite recently with Leonard Cheshire Disability, who specifically wanted to raise the access to work fund with me. And they basically reflected what you were saying as if it's used properly and people know about it. It can actually be very supportive. Um, but what she was saying is that they were disappointed that it wasn't being devolved. Mm -hmm. So while we're devolving disability benefits and we're devolving these programmes, hopefully we can design something better. We don't, we're not going to have access or it's not going to be devolved, so we can't bring it into the new design. Would you say that that was a problem as well? Um, I think what Diane's story shows that there's definitely a problem with how linked up things are. Yeah. Um, access to work is part of the DWP, and yet it doesn't seem to have been designed to function smoothly with the process that people are being through, put through in the work program. Um, it, I, I've still yet to understand why um, Diane's access to work application was cancelled, because she didn't have some piece of paper which said it was okay for a do permitted work. Why are you on the work programme if you're not expecting to get permitted work at some point? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it should have been smooth and seamless, and that's what Dan needed it to be. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I would, I, I would agree with what Leonard Cheshire was saying, and that it, it can be a huge source of benefit. It's a wonderful thing. It's, it's like the NHS. When it works, it's amazing. But if, if, you're, if you're prevented from accessing it properly, um, or if there's barriers put in the way of it operating smoothly, then it, 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 can, it can be very frustrating. Yeah. Thanks very much. Christina? Uh, thanks very much. Uh, uh, convener, thank you so much for your testimony this morning. You're getting a full set. I grew up in Easterhouse. So, <laughs> so you get a full set of East End folk here today. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was about um, whether you know the opportunities, and I know about the confidence building course, but the opportunities offered to you were tailored towards your skill, whether there was any sort of a skills analysis done on what, what you can do, what you know, your, what experience you've got, you know, where you've got aspirations to go as well. Was any of that taken into account? Were you offered any tailored courses that would allow you to realise some of those um, aspirations that you had? Well, I explained my situation to them about uh, the voluntary that I was doing. But as I say, they were just concentrating. You just have to get a job and get a job. As soon as any job, yeah, that's the way I felt. Uh -huh. So when something like employment is something that's supposed to fulfil you as well mm -hmm. as you know, you know, give you a bit of money to, to live your life as well. That there was no interest in that. It was just any job. It was just to get any job on your list or any job that they thought that you were 
capable of doing your, that you were to go forward and put your name forward for it and do uh -huh. the application for it. Uh -huh. That was just my personal uh -huh. situation. Donna, you said that you've got some specific skills around about therapies and stuff. Yeah. Was anything offered to you to, to uh -huh. realise that? Well, my, the, the last the advisor I have at the minute, um, Dio is brilliant. She's tried to, um, I needed like Reiki 3 to be a Reiki master. Yep. So she's contact, going to contact people for me and she's actually trying to cater. She feels she, she would like to be more empowered. If she could give me more help, she could, she would. Mm -hmm. You know, like pay for more courses and things like that too. So, because um, before I was under a banner, a big organisation, but now try to get out on your own, it's not so easy. So, but, um, She's offered to help me work, um, uh, to get it online and everything, and to so she's definitely trying to help me as an individual. Well, and the person who I had at the start who demoralised me, and, and this woman I've got now, they both have the same job, the same job title, but this woman is empowering me, and so I just feel like. Um, Your experience is complete inconsistency, a, inconsistency amongst advisors, and that's yeah. something that maybe everybody has, has experienced. Yeah. And I'm also dyslexic, so I, um, initially, um, and I, I do see that as a barrier in finding job. And, I, and I, if it wasn't for the, I don't know if I would have got so, I was so frightened when I got made redundant, I was going to get sanctioned with my dyslexia, with all the forums and all that, and missing out dates. I thought, I could get that wrong and my children won't get fed that week. You know, it was a terrifying experience, and I'm sure if that wasn't in place, I wouldn't have got so stressed. Yeah. Do yeah. you understand what I'm saying? So that's your advisor, and that's yeah. your advisor that you worked with as well. But the actual work programme, has that made any difference to the, the advances that you have both made in your in your life? Would you have done it anyway? That's what I mean. Would you have, you know, pursued some of the issue, yeah, the ideas that you and your group, um, uh, your activity group in, in Glasgow have done? Would you have pursued some of your training and all the opportunities there anyway? Did the work programme make any difference to you? The second advice, um, my, new, my advice, I'm now definitely, she's helped me. And, and I would I would be in a mental hospital if I stayed with that other advice now, or I would have shot him. Oh, so that, okay. that's that in a nutshell. But this other one has definitely encouraged me and, and really helped me grow as a person again because uh -huh. I was down and she's really helped me believe in myself again. So I really believe um, and I'm grateful for the help that lady's yeah. given me. Yeah. yeah. As, as of June this year, um, Third Force News had a report from the DWP that suggested only 24% of people going through the work programme were successful and only 9% of them were in a job after a year. And I think, what was the figure? The DWP had paid the providers £1.8 billion pounds since the scheme had started for that type of outcome. And that's where I'm trying to get to, is, is all of that money you know, worth the service that you have been given, any of you? No, that's a bit scary, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And I was going to ask you about access to work as well, because I always used... My background was in social work and I used access to work for a number of people. In fact, as a unison steward, I used access to work for a number of people to get the, the, the right adjustments they needed in the workplace. So if that's something that's completely failing as well, and you're absolutely right, people don't know about it. How, how do you think that we can make you know, people more aware of that, that type of service being available? Um, I think there's a great deal of education with employers that could be done. Um, if It's something that employers I, uh, should ask every employee um, as soon as they're appointed. Um, it should be explored because a lot of people who um, could benefit from access to work may not know what how they can benefit. Um, a lot of the experiences I've had working with interns has been to tell them about what access to work can do and, and nine times out of ten you get a very surprised, oh I didn't know I could get that, that might actually be quite helpful. Um, I've actually used access to work myself um, and uh, in a fairly minor way, but uh, it it certainly made a, a huge difference to keeping me able to pr to do my job at the at the level that I was I was uh, I was capable of doing it. Um, so it, it it's often referred to within my um, my work field as the best kept secret of the DWP because it does seem like there's no one's trying to actually make it known. Uh, and, it, and it's being cut because it's being underused, um, which is going to be a cyclical problem. If you don't if you don't encourage people to use it, they're not going to use it, and then you're going to cut it, and then you're going to spend even less money on telling people about it, and um, and so on. It, and it, it it's a lifeline. It's a vital lifeline for a lot of people. Um, it can make relatively small amounts of money can make a huge difference. 
Uh, I mean, you, you're talking spend a couple of hundred quid, maybe a thousand pounds at the beginning of someone's employment. And that person could be a productive worker for decades to come. But, you know, you don't spend that money and, it, and, it, and it's not going to happen. Yeah. OK, thank you. Just very, very quickly, um, convener, um, the Disability Benefits Consortium have produ produced a, a report as well, and I, I just got sight, sight of some of it this morning. And it was to really pick up something that you said, Donna, was the fear that you had, the absolute fear that then exasperated maybe your, your, your condition, but also the fear of be being sanctioned about whether your, your kids would be um, fed or not. And one of the key elements of this report is to talk to people about the reduction in ESA, that's been proposed and the impact that would then have on them. And 69% of them said their health would get worse. And 69% said they would struggle to pay their bills. 70 said they would struggle to maintain their independence, which is something that's vitally important to your own mental health and, and well-being. And 28% of them said that they couldn't afford to eat. Now, if that's what, you know, if people are having that type of experience now and there's a further cut then to their benefit, um, with more pressures put on them for some of the things that you've said that you were made to do, what, what kind of impact do you think that would have on you as an individual, but maybe people that you know that are stuck in the system? Squashing. Folk, it? It's kind of squashing you in the earbox, whether you want it or no. no. Um, and it's a shame because I think I've been to other countries in the world, and Scotland's a great place. We've got lots of great stuff going on, but I just feel like we're getting this bit wrong now and it's a shame because I've always valued who I'm or where we come from, do you know what I mean? And, and and the way the Scots think. But I just feel like that's a shame. It's just the, 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 it's kind of a, like the rich dictating to the poor and squishing them in the box. He's just so that nobody's watching what the rich are doing. So I just feel like it's an awful shame that the media's only covering us and no covering what's happening with the banks, etc. Class warfare in oh, the Oh, definitely, other. definitely. I think this is about the whole, it's just big propaganda. Okay. Propaganda. Thanks, Convener. Um, thank you, Convener. Good morning to you all. Um, I wanted just to ask about um, how easy it was for you to um, access your provider and speak to your advisor. So was the, provide, was, was the um, provider based locally to where um, you live and how far did you have to travel to see your advisor? go up uh, by Ridbury, so it's in the city centre. I was going, so just the bus journey, it was 20 minutes down, 20 minutes back home on the bus. Yeah. I'm the same, I just stayed five minutes first, so um, that wasn't a problem. Right. But it was where I was in my head when I first got asked to sure. go, because I was only just made redundant, just was on the sick, the next minute I had to go here, <coughs> and I was just like, I'm supposed to be no well. I thought when you were sick, you were sick. You get the because everybody else had seen being on a sick for years, and I was asked to go there straight away. I found that quite th frightening. If I didn't go, I was worried. And how often did you, did you have to go, and how long did each appointment last for? Once a week, or um, and it would be anything from an hour to three, four hours, and it can be. It would be once we are whenever the your advisor advised you to come in. So he would say to me, "You come in. You could come in here every day and look for a job. I don't see what's stopping you." But looking for a job would be what Jackie explained. Sitting me a book and just going through the. Should be ignored all the phone all day long. Doesn't pick your confidence up, in my opinion. Can I just cut in, John? Um, you know, uh, politicians um, go canvassing and will phone and, you know, when, when things are going well, it feels great. And when things are are going badly, it can be demoralising, you know, if you're going into an area that's not familiar or natural territory. You know, it's just the spirit. What, what, what is it like if you're three, four hours or the whole day on the phone and, and just getting the knock back? What, what do you feel at the end of it when you come out? Sometimes you feel like screaming because you're getting told no constantly for the three, four hours. You're doing your best to try and uh, get in contact with somebody that may be offering you a job. So you you get in a wee bit uh, built up, but when you're coming out, you're just hitting the ground. And some of them are saying to you on the phone, don't phone here again. Is that a, are you in that office again? Blah, blah, blah. Please don't call here again. So you're like, oh. And You're damned if you do and damned if you don't. Anything? Sorry, John. Sorry. 
it, we, you've spoken um, at length about the, the difficulties that you, you faced, but did you get any um, help which was um, particularly helpful or unexpected? Was, was, was there anything positive which you took from the meetings you had with, with the advisors and, and the provider? Well, you're, uh, you're going for an interview and that, they give you the so much where well, you get a, a realist of you need black trousers or a blouse, you get kind of a, some clothes and shoes to go for interviews and yeah, you get learnt your re interview techniques. They give you wee tips and things like that, which was quite that was quite good and helpful. Some people having to go or get in they've got tracksuit bottoms on and they're not suitable for going for an interview. So it was good that way, you got help that way. And like your bus fares. Yeah. And Jacqueline, I think you say at the end of your statement that you've now got a job. Can you tell us a bit about your job and how and how you got that? Yeah, I got that myself. My friends all work in all different cleaning companies, so just phoned up one of my friends and was there any jobs going at the time? Yes, there was. So working for half past five to nine o'clock in the morning, Monday to Friday. Enjoying that. Enjoying that. Yeah. I've got an income now coming in for the house and I've not got any hassle. Yeah. You're going to these job centres and that, I can breathe a wee bit more easy. Well done. And Good. still doing my voluntary, because I've still got the rest of the day. I do my work in the morning. I do my voluntary hmm. all the rest of the day. I'm busy on Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, running where we laundry is based in our church. Yeah. So does that mean you don't have to go to see your, your, your advisor a, as often, or do you still have to go to those appointments? No, because my experience was previous, two years ago. Right, I okay. was on that. So I'm working and I've been doing it yeah. voluntary, so that's how I've came to do for the previous. So I don't know how it's changed for when I was there to just now. That's just kind of a Mavi story. Just in that voluntary um, activity, um, do you find that people who are involved in voluntary activity, which can sometimes be the backbone of the community, that your voluntary activity is affected because you've been forced to go through this charade of getting into offices to phone and look for non-existent jobs and that pulls you away from actually helping vulnerable people? Well, as I say, we run the wee pensioners club each week we give them lunch every Wednesday. So that's got all our community, well, our community to put all the old houses down and built new houses, so it took the community away for a good few years. So we've brought the community back together bringing these people out of their houses that don't get out of their house for one week to another. They're getting new friends and we're doing all different things. We run wee dances, we do backpacking, we take them away for the day. Uh, we give ourselves a wee treat and that's so that's the kind of things we look forward to doing and, and we're happy that somebody goes, well that was great, I enjoyed my soup and my sandwiches today, thanks very much and I'll see you next week again. So that gives you the wee boost, that's all you're kind of looking for. You're not getting any money for that, so you've got that wee self respect you've helped somebody and you've helped yourself that's the way I see it okay yeah. cool. and then can I just add that uh, there are a lot of disabled people who are on the group which uh, I forget the name but it's the one where you're not basically not expected to work you're, you're, you're just getting your uh, your ESA what used to be incapacity benefit um, perhaps would like to change that situation. They would like to get into work and they, they, they might pursue that through volunteering. But they are often put off from volunteering through fear that if by doing so, the DWP decides that actually they're fit for work and takes benefits away. So it's a, it's a catch-22. They, they, they want to get into a better situation, but they're so terrified of the, the, the sanctions that, that they hold off from doing so. It's, it's not helpful. Okay, John. Very much, convener. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but the committee commissioned some uh, research into the work programme from the University of Edinburgh. And uh, what is quite significant is that just reading through the conclusions of the research, they really reflect the, your individual stories. And uh, you know, like they point out things like providers may not sufficiently match suitable claimants to specific vacancies. They talk a lot about people's anxiety, the thought of sanctions, and uh, the payments by result financial model doesn't reward progress made um, in bringing claimants closer to work. One of the other things that the researcher says, and I just wondered if this was something that you had come across, is that the research found that they, they thought that personal advisors were under pressure to meet performance targets. Is that your experience? 
I think the advisors have set a target as well when they're, uh -huh. in their work, maybe set to, I don't know how they, they work to go. So many people into a job and you're, you're dealing with all different ones, no? I just think that the companies themselves have got targets to set. Yeah. That's how they, I know people go and work, some of them like their work, but a lot of the advisors go, I hate doing this. As well. But you think, you know, mm -hmm. by having performance targets, they're, they're giving advice or treating you in a way which is inappropriate and unhelpful because it's all about meeting these targets? Definitely. I think if, you, if you've not got a target hanging over you, you can then treat a person as an individual and get to know them. And, but um, <coughs> I, 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 I do believe, like, the first person, he was, he was working under the target when they used to do that and his company would have stopped, but he's still in that habit, uh, get, get them at the door, do you know what I'm talking about, get them into a job. And I say to him, do you get a target money for me? And he's like, oh no, they've done away with that there, he says, but um, but you are able to work anyways, do you know what I mean? So so I don't know if they still do that in that company, but because um, I know that the next advisor had a totally different attitude than the target, and I'm sure it's because she works under Alice targeted regime, if you understand. Sure. I, I just wanted to go back to, to Jake and to go back to this issue of vol volunteering and the flexibility of the programme. Um, one of the things, again, that our research showed was that the programme wasn't flexible and, and it was so inflexible that it actually stopped people advancing. And I was struck by the fact that in your evidence you say that, that you went to Business Gateway to, to get help with your laundrette, which is probably, from what you've said, your best chance of finding work. That's where your skills were. But Business Gateway couldn't help you until you came off the work programme. So in that way, the work programme was actually stopping you stopping advancing. Going further with the Business Gateway. Yeah. But then when I went to jobs in business in Easter House in Glasgow, that was when my advisor helped me go through done all the business plan with us. Right. So he helped me the most that way. Was that after you finished on the work programme? Mm -hmm. Right, so it was only after you finished on the work programme mm -hmm. that you were really able yeah. to make progress. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right, OK. Thanks very much. No bother. OK. Neil? Uh, this is, uh, uh, session has really di disturbed me and upset me. In fact, it's disgusted me what's happening to you people. And, and the system that we've created, the atmosphere in this system is just so wrong. It's, I find it incredible the more evidence that people present to us about this. It absolutely disgusts me. And it also disgusts me what they've done to public servants who are on the front line of having to deal with people who are going through this bloody system because I don't think for one second they want to treat people like this. The vast majority of them, 99 point. 9% of them don't want to treat people as. And they're in the front line of having to deal with government policy. It is outrageous what is happening here. Um, I think, though, we have to get away from the, the view that just because you devolve something is better, because that's simply not the case. We can devolve some stuff and make it worse. And, and so we, I think we have to park that to the side and say that the system we've got is clearly not working. And there's so many different elements that are not working that, you know, I just I just really don't know where we're going to go with this. this where, where you're doing clearly very good work within your community. I look at you and I see so many of my pals and, my, and people in my community doing that type of work. Where's this, where is the sanity of taking you out a system where you taking out you out a place where you're doing good voluntary work in your community, building your community, to sit and thumb through effectively a phone book and cold call people. What's that? I mean that just is madness. Absolute madness. I suppose what I'm getting to is what kind of system should we create? What would you, if if you're looking for work, I've signed on before in the past. Going into the job centre is probably the most depressing experience one of the most depressing experiences in my life. So how do we create a system where you walk through that door and you actually feel as though there's a bit of hope and a bit of ambition and, and, and that people are there to help you and me, when it was me, to move on in your life? What kind of system would you like to see created? Well, the UK 
Again, you could say, engineers, you can come out here. <laughs> We're engineer friendly out here. Yeah. You know how you like, yeah. skilled workers, bring me workers, break us up and individuals, no? And no, so, we're not all the same. Mm -hmm. I have nothing in common with an 18 year old boy. Or, do you know what I mean? So, would, would, it, would it help if you had a list of available vacancies, either in the East End or the city centre, that you could actually go and ask them? You know, would they give you an interview rather than doing the cold call into companies? Would it help if the work programme had those vacancies there for you? I used to work in a job centre, I used to get a job centre, they'd be up on the board, you get one, you go sit down and... But I yeah. Surely that still exists. Because... Uh, it's not quite... Uh, there, it used to be on um, computer format where you would look up, the, uh, you know, where the vacancies are. Does that, does that still happen? But it's like, you, you put in for your vacancy and it, and it can be in England, it can be in Hingmey, so you try and get it by in local, do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And you're still in, I'm in Glasgow, so I'm still getting sent a and I'm leaving or wherever, do you know what I mean? And I'm like, it's not local to me, but that's the jobs that will come up on the okay. screen. Um, and the, the bottom line is the issue is not um, putting through people through endless courses that are presumably going to be the magic ticket to a job. The, the, the issue is there's not enough jobs. Surely that's the bottom line, that what we need to create is more jobs. I mean, somebody said to me the other day, and this rung very true, we've probably got the most educated workforce that we've ever had in our history, but we've got the most unequal society that we've ever had in our history. Therefore, the problem isn't to, you know, shove more education down people's throats, it's to actually create a system where we become more equal, and that's giving people employment. Um, and that's the dilemma that I think we're having to uh, wrestle with. Um, my contribution is not asking you many questions. It's just allowing me to express my frustration at the system that you're going through. And I can, I can hear it in your voice and can see it uh, for your evidence. And I hear it from people in my own constituency. So, um, again... It's needed. Because a lot of folk are coming out of factory work or engineering and you know, like the shipyards and all that. They're skilled workers in one area and that's no the areas. We're needing to change and re-skills, so different would, skills. Where so should that training be? I think a workplace, if I was setting one up, that's the first thing I would do, would retrain, get people IT skills. A lot of folk are factory workers, don't have the IT skills to switch on the computers and things like that. And you need to take away the fear factor mm -hmm. and enable people just to apply for the jobs. What's your experience with people in your community? You both stay quite near each other in the Ridge area, which I know well. Um, what, what kind of jobs do for people who are unemployed in the area what kind of jobs are they moving into, do you, do you think? Well, in my area, it's at Black Hill and Provima, which is quite a, a bad area for well, a few years ago. So a lot of the youth had grown up with drugs, drink. So the last few years are kind of a, the younger ones that's grown up. So they're all getting into apprenticeships now. Apprenticeship. They're getting into a, a lot of apprenticeships. Um, well, what about people who've been made redundant? You know, like Donna, you were made redundant. Um, people that maybe worked in a you know, factory for a number of years, factory shuts down or the office closes. You know, you're call talking about... Work. That's the kind of is work that, that's... Is that mostly what, what it is, call centre? Call centre, a lot of cleaning work, do you know what I mean? Uh, as in cleaning, and, and, and men are getting... getting uh, they're building up all the new houses in Glasgow, so a lot of folk are getting jobs through right. that. But, um, but again, people are getting their apprenticeships and only getting the work to the apprenticeships, and then they're not getting any experience. So you're getting these kids that are going through apprenticeships. That are, are you talking about, you know, would maybe regard this proper apprenticeships? Or are you talking about the apprenticeships that are the, you know, like, the new. The, you know, there's a label put on it, you're doing an apprenticeship, but it's not really. Mm -hmm. Sometimes some of them are for a year, but other ones, some of the people I've known have moved on and got other jobs, they've carried on their apprenticeship two and three years down the line. I know that um, certainly the Wheatley Group have a um, who own the housing stock in Glasgow, the Glasgow Housing Association have a, a guarantee of apprenticeships for tenants of their um, uh, sons and daughters of tenancy there, so that maybe a, a number are getting apprenticeships there. Claire and then Christina. Um, if, it, if I could just say, convene, I think that you know we have to be very careful not to disrespect the young people that are going through apprenticeships at the moment, because all of them are going through accredited 
uh, apprenticeships um, that have the support of the employers behind them. And I think, you know, um, we do a service by trying to say that there's something wrong in that system. I don't think that's that's very fair on the young people. Um, if I could just say um, as well, um, in terms of the, we, we will be getting some of the control over Social Security. Um, we would like to have more, as has been um, expressed by Joan today as well. But um, what you've experienced is down to leadership and what we've seen from the, the government officials who've come to give evidence here and then speaking to Priti Patel, the, the minister, um, there seems to be a complete denial that there are um, about the experience of people from the, the um, leadership at the moment. But what the Scottish Government have said is that dignity and respect will be at the heart of the social security system that we will build for Scotland. Do you feel that dignity and respect are part of the system at the moment? I would love to see uh, that happen. What's needed to, to make that happen? I have yet to meet anyone in my work that thinks the job centre is there to help them get a job. They think it's there to take the benefits away if they don't jump through all the hoops that they're asked. Um, if we could change it so that people who walk in a job centre feel that they're going to a place which actually is going to listen to them and understand them and meet their needs to help them get into a job, and we'll, we'll have done a great good. A quick question, and maybe Phil, you'll, you'll be in a better position to answer this than anybody else. But one of the other things that I'd been reading about was people, especially people with disabilities, um, with maybe complex disabilities or, or, or some challenges, just being parked by some of these employment agencies uh, and, and just left there because they get the money for them anyway. Um, and whether that's something that you, you feel is. Um, Initially, it was, it was thought because when the work programme was quite new that that was maybe just something that happened because people didn't have to build up the skill set and to enable um, that dedicated support for that person um, and whether you know that would get better with time. Have, have you got any experience of you knowing people who have been parked and whether it has got any better but in, in time or has it got worse? Um, I can't, I can't say it's gotten better with time, but I definitely do have experience of working with disabled people who've been in the system for some time and just don't feel like it's getting them anywhere. And an opportunity like the ones that we've been running recently has come along and they've grabbed it with both hands and it has made a big difference. Um, we had a set of interns actually in, here in the Parliament that did very well indeed um, out of that. And some of them had been through all these things, work programme, etc., cetera, and, and they'd just basically been written off. Um, <coughs> That it was clear that people didn't feel that they had enough to offer to be worth the bother, but they proved them wrong. Um, and I think that's it. It's just a lack of vision to realise that disabled people um, all have a contribution to make and in, in many cases have a, a particular special contribution to make to, to a lot of areas of work because of their, their lived experience. Um, but there's a lot of things that need to be improved to, to make that possible. You can't just point to one part of the system and say that's the problem. Um, there needs to be more awareness of what can be done to make adjustments and make, make, uh, make things more inclusive. And do you think it helps at all when you hear Michael Heseltine saying this is the best time to lose your job because there's loads of opportunities? Mm. Yeah, your answer's clear. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Donna and Jake, I'm going to give you the last word. Um, Claire had mentioned about any new system uh, in Scotland should be based in dignity and respect. If there were a couple of simple things about the work programme that you could change, what, what would they be? What would you do to make it different? Just want a bit more respect in the way some of them speak to you. Know them all, just some, some of them. Okay. I sit down and listen to you what it is, what skills you can do and where you think you can work and sit and see an advisor and see if they can match you up instead of being dictated to all the time, but actually ask you what it is you want to do and how we can help would be great. Okay, thank you. Um, I know it can't have been easy for you, but thank you very much for coming to the meeting and, and helping us to understand a bit better what it's actually like for ordinary working people to go through that that process. Phil, can you 
pass on our best wishes to Diane. Thank her for the, the statement and I uh, hope things uh, work out for her. So thank you all very much indeed. Okay. And at that, I'll suspend the meeting and we'll move into private session.